think at the right balance of listening to me and not listening to me. He has done a few things that I wanted him to do, and then he has done something that I didn't want him to do, <laughs> but that turned out to be very successful, in spite of me saying, oh, this is not going to work, or this is not a good idea, and then it ended up being really good. So it's all his merit. So let's hear what he has to say. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Antonio. Yeah, thanks for coming. So finally, this is our last day and the last hour as a student after so many years of education. So today, I will talk about my research on interpretable representation learning for visual intelligence. So we are at this moment, the revolution of AI just seems taking over everything. You can, for every application, you can, deep, you can use deep neural networks. So deep neural networks are everywhere, so they are playing the Go that outperform our best human players. Deep neural network also making medical decisions, so after training images with annotations, the, the network can tell you whether you have tumor or not. Neural network also understanding the visual things, so giving an input image, the network can segment the image into the semantic categories and tell you this is a region of flow and the region of person and cars. So I am a computer vision researcher. So if you take a look at the uh, papers published at the top vision conference, such as CVPR, ICCV, more than two thirds of papers are using deep learning based methods. So one of the milestone tasks in computer vision is object classification. So basically people train this network on large scale data sets, then the network can recognize the category of those objects. So ImageNet is a uh, very popular and, and widely used uh, large scale Im image uh, sets people train network. So after 2012, all the winner method on ImageNet is a uh, deep learning based method. So people build deeper and deeper network, get better performers. So from 2012, AlexNet with five common layers, to VGG with 16 layers, to GoogleNet with 22 layers, to recent ResNet or DenseNet, which using more than 100 layers. So people propose deeper and deeper network to boost the final performers. So you can see the accuracies on, on the test sets is increased over the years from 84% to recent 95 or 96%. So, but as you know, deep learning is representation learning. The final output is just one part of story. Another part of story are the internal representations, giving so many units and so many layers what are they doing? So here are the three central questions I explored in my thesis work. So, I mean, I would like to explore more questions, but it may take longer to graduate. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Antonio have more students who are working So the three central questions is that, the first one is what have been learned inside the networks? The second one is how to interpret the internal representation? The third one is why the network gives some predictions? So give you an input image, give you the prediction. Why is that? So I want to answer the three questions in my thesis work. So this is uh, also relevant to an uh, important issue, the interpretability of deep neural network. So the interpretability is relevant to many topics. For example, it's relevant to the safety of AI models. So when we deploy the AI models in those real applications, such as uh, autonomous driving, Definitely, we want to make sure that AI models are doing reasonable things, so we don't want the Uber accident to happen again. So also, the interpretability is relevant to the trust of AI decisions. Let's say the AI models tell you you have cancer, so how confident the prediction is, how confident you can trust the models. It's also relevant to the policy and the regulation. So here is the regulation, the GDPR re regulation issued by European Union, so we require the AI models to explain themselves. So common people have the right to the explanation for any algorithmic decision. So basically, if you want to deploy the AI models, person have the right to ask why they give, you, give me such prediction. So here's the outline of my thesis. So here is a, is a standard deep neural network widely used in visual recognition. It's called convolution neural network. So giving an input image, network doing some convolutions, then give the, give the prediction which same category this image come from. So it's crystal clear that each unit at each layer are doing convolution, but things get messy when we train this network on millions of training samples. 
So the first part of my thesis is to, to interpret the internal representations. So I will show that those internal representation, internal units are actually doing meaningful things. They are detecting those meaningful concepts within the network. The second part of the thesis is to explain the prediction. So given the image, I predicted as a cafeteria, so I want to understand why this network gave me such prediction, so I want to understand the decision making of the network. The third part is I will show some preliminary results on representation learning towards video understanding. So let's get started. So previously I already showed that people have very nice models work for object classification. So they can train the models and recognize the object inside the image. So those are, those are objects stand alone inside the image. However, in real scenario, there are several different objects They jointly form the whole things. So you can see that many objects inside this kitchen things, they jointly form the things. So if you really want to scale, scale up the vision recognition system to real scenario, we need to work towards visual scene understanding. So previously, there are no large-scale uh, large data sets that are large enough to train that work from scratch. Therefore, I built up the Places database. So Places is the largest uh, scene recognition data set so far. It contains 10 million images from 400 scene categories. Here I show you some image samples from one scene category, the bedroom. So we have the spare bedroom, messy bedroom, teenager bedroom, romantic bedroom. So all those different samples from the training samples, then hopefully the network training our data set can be generalized to real scenario. So after we collect this data set, so we train our models. So after I train the models, I build up an online demo because it's always very rewarding when you when we train the models and can play it around and see how accurate it is. It actually turned out to be very accurate. So for this particular things, the demo, the network gave me the prediction as a conference room. So here is another image I upload, it predicted as a highway. So the first top one prediction seems not so accurate, but the top two prediction is car interval. So it's amazing that the demo is aware I'm inside a car. So third one prediction is also correct, it's field row. So I try it and I also upload more abstract things. So I upload this paintings. The network still can recognize it correctly as a, a cultivated field. So it's amazing that this network can generalize and to recognize the things. So I want to understand, better understand what's going on there. So right now we have two recognition tasks and two networks. So the first one is a, a network trained down image net for object classification. So the second one is a network trained down places for scene recognition. So I train the two network on two data sets from scratch, but I keep the network the same architecture. So through that, I can analyze how the different inputs affect the building or construction of internal representations. So the first thing I tried is to visualize the internal unit. So I follow a data-driven way to visualize the internal unit. So basically, I prepare a set of testing images and I fade the images inside the network and then I record activations of each unit for each image. So let's say I want to visualize three units at layer five of this network. So I can simply rank all those images by some unit activation. So here I get uh, top activated images for unit one. So we can further use the feature map of the unit to segment the, each image. So through that I can highlight which image region is most activated regions. It turns out this unit are detecting the LAN so I can do the similar visualization for other units. So for this uh, unit two, it seems detecting the face. And uh, here's another one, seems detecting the trademarks. So there are a lot of related work on network visualization. For example, the deconvolution is a, a way to visualize the units. So this shows that the unit at the lower layer, so layer two, are detecting texture or ages. The unit at the higher layer, such as layer five, are detecting more semantic meaningful concepts such as uh, dog head or bicycle wheels. So the backpropagation is also a popular way to visualize the internal knowledge. So basically they generate a gradient, then use a gradient to modify the input image, then they can backproject the, the weights into image space and visualize it. So also image synthesize have been used to visualize the units. So basically people train a network, then 
train your network it's a generative model then they can generate an image that maximize activation or final unit or some inter, uh, in, in, intermediate units so those visualizations are pretty cool they give you the intuition what have been learned inside but one issue with the visualization is that they are qualitative you always can do some cherry picking and include some good examples and ignore the rest so right now i want to go from the qualitative visualization to quantitative interpretation so the first thing I tried is to manually annotate the unit. So it's how, how we manually annotate the image. So right now we manually annotate the unit. So basically we, we get the top activated images and then send to Amazon Mac Network. Then we ask the workers to come up with some description to summarize the image. Then we ask them to cross out the outliers, then further categories, categorize the written description into one of the uh, meta classes from high level concept categories are scene, region, object to low level concepts such as texture or simple elements. So here is one annotation result for unit 112. So the unit uh, from places common at. So you can see the label given by the worker is a pool table. So this unit are detecting different kinds of pool tables. It's even invariant to the different poses of a pool table. But however, this unit is confused with another pattern. It's confused with a swimming pool. Because swimming pool and pool table have some visual similarities, so this unit makes such a mistake. So here's another unit uh, annotation. So unit uh, 76. As a, um, uh, so the, the annotation given by the worker is legs. So this unit are really like different kinds of legs, like person leg, or bird leg, some dog legs. So let's take a look at that. let's take a look at the uh, histogram. So here are the units uh, annotated as object in the layer five of ImageNet common net. So you can see the most frequent detector is a dog detector. So why is that? Because out of the 1,000 ImageNet categories, there are about 2,000 dog categories. So people spend so much effort to train that work, it turns out you get a dog specialist. So we do the similar things to places. So here's a histogram of the units annotated as object. So you can see the most frequent detector is a building, then is a tree, grass. So from this comparison, you can see that the two network completely build a different set of vocabulary to represent the input data. Also, there are a lot of units uh, acting as uh, those interpretable detectors that detect the meaningful concepts. So this is a unit at uh, layer five. Let's take a look at all the, all the layers. So here, this plot shows um, the, the number of units as a detector for object parts versus uh, over the layers from layer one to layer five. So you can see for both of the network, there are more and more object detector inside, object parts detector inside the two network. So here is another plot showing the percentage of units as a detectors for object in both of the network. So for both of the places common at and image net common at, the number of units as a object detectors keep increase over the layers. What's interesting here is that there are more object detectors in places common at compared to image net common at. This is interesting because when we train places common at, we don't have any object supervision. The only supervision we have is that this is a set of living room image, this set of kitchens. We don't have object supervisions. So those object detectors, more like emergent detectors, they emerge inside the network without explicit supervision. This also makes sense because like for human, you recognize this is a conference room. You see the table and the chair and also the persons and we recognize this is a conference room. So neural network is doing the similar things. It's trying to disentangle the meaningful concepts inside the signals before it comes to the final prediction. So from this results, I can answer the first question. So what have been learned inside the network? So there are a lot of interpretable concept detector emerging inside the network. So this previous work, and we only visualize the AlexNet, which is already six years old. The AlexNet only have five, la five common layers and about 1,000 units. Right now, people are using much deeper networks, such as ResNet. So it's impossible to manually annotate those 100,000 units. I mean, we can manually annotate that, that, but my advisors were not happy about this because that will take a lot of money. 
So we want to save, mo save money, and uh, we also want to interpret the networks. So what we should do? So I spent so much effort to try to figure out. Luckily, I have the David Bao sitting there, so we work together, and finally we figure out a solution. It's called network dissection. So by the way, I was always impressed by David Bao's the skills on this programming and also the numerical computation. But later on, it turned out David Bao have co-authored a textbook on numerical computation. It's really impressed me. That, people, uh, that textbook get the uh, 4,000 citations. So really impressed. So, so we jointly propose this network dissections. So it's an autom automatic way to interpret and uh, quantify the interpretability of networks. So we can throw any network inside this toolkit that will out it will output and then help identify the most inter interpretable unit to also evaluate the interpretability of networks. So how it works? So it's, the idea is actually pretty simple. We just evaluate the unit for semantic cementation. So rather than annotate uh, each unit, we first propel a set of a testing data sets. So this data set contains 60,000 images uh, with 1,200 concepts. So after we generate the top activity images, then we first segment that, because right now we have the pixel-wise annotation for each one of the image in our testing data sets. So we can simply use a, a unit activation to segment the semantic mask. So here the semantic mask shows that uh, we know the label for each one of the pixels. So right now we can simply count how many pixels have been correctly segmented. So right now we use uh, intersection over union to measure the accuracy of the units to segment the concept. So intersection over union is that we take the area of the overlap between the detected region and quantitative region and divide by the union of the two regions. So this gives give us a number to measure how accurate this unit detects some concept. So here we associate the top concept as an interpretation for, for that unit. So here is the results. Um, for a baseline network, is the uh, AlexNet trained down places. So here's a histogram of all the interpretable units. So out of the 256 units at layer five, there are more than 100 units detecting different, con uh, different concepts. So there are totally uh, 72 unique concepts. So we have uh, 22 or 32 copy detectors, 16 detectors, other some texture detectors. So here is one unit. The interpretation given by the meso is a card detector. So here's another interpretation of the unit. So it's a rope, so it's a detecting rope. So here you can see the IOU is not that high compared to the supervised trained OB detectors. But I should emphasize that those, in, those are the internal units. They emerge as OB detectors without um, explicit supervision. So they are more like a weakly supervised OB detectors. Because this is the automation um, way to interpret the units, so we can do a lot of interesting things. So previously, I really, really showed that there are a lot of units emerge in the well-trained network. But how about the network during the training? So we apply the network dissection to analyze the network during the training. So I will plot uh, animation to the horizontal axis, the trainer iteration, the vertical axis, the uh, number of unique detectors across the categories. So you can see how the training iteration goes up. There are more and more semantic detectors emerge inside the network. So finally, it uh, converts there. So it's correlated with uh, accuracy on the validation set. So this accuracy on the validation set is a common scenario. People just use this to monitor the training process. So right now, we show that you can also use the interpretability as a metric to monitor and debug the training process. So we further use this technique to analyze the uh, generalization across data sets. So here is a very common scenario. You have a pre-trained network, then you fine tuning this on your own data sets, which maybe the data set uh, is very small, you don't have so much samples, so just fine tuning a pre-trained network, then it can converge faster and get a better performance. So right now I want to analyze what is happening during the fine tuning process. So I design experiments so I have a pre-trained network on ImageNet, and then I fine tuning this to places. So right now I keep track of one unit. So at the beginning of the fine tuning, this is a unit uh, at the ImageNet pre-trained model. So of course this unit are detecting dog. So this is a unit A that are detecting the dog. So then I fine tuning the whole network to places. 
So you can see gradually the interpretation of this unit change. So it's changing into a waterfall detector from a dock detector after we fine tuning this network to places. So you can see compare with the concept before, you can see the two concepts are different, but they share some visual similarities, like the, the detecting those white and the black stripes. So why they can, the feature can be reused and fine tune into a new concept very quickly. So right now I do the other way around. So I have a places pre-tune model. Now I fine tuning this to ImageNet. So how, how many of you think this will come back as a dog detector? Okay, so let's see how this will turn into. So fine tuning this to ImageNet gradually. <laughs> so it's changed back as a dog detectors, but a different kind of dog. So you can see this also share some similarities of detecting the white and the black stripes. So here is another my frequent example. So at the beginning of the fine tuning, this uh, detecting the stripe or some geometric shapes. So can anyone have a guess what this one will turn into? Oh, tree. <laughs> tree? <laughs> okay, let's see how this one will turn into. It gradually changes concept. So after fine tuning, this change into a dog ear detector because there are so many dog categories, you need to capture those five green attributes of the dog to differentiate different dog categories. So you need doing readable things to turn into a dog ear detectors. So you can see compared with the concept before fine tuning, they share such a geometric shape similarities. So we can further apply this technique to all the different architectures such as AlexNet, VGG, GoogleNet, ResNet, trained down two data sources from scratch, the ImageNet and Places. So here is a plot showing the number of unique concepts across those different architectures. So you can see as we go in deeper using VGG or ResNet, there are more number of unique detectors there. And also there are more um, interpretable units uh, in uh, network trained for thing classification compared to uh, object classification. So here I show you some example units. So here is a house detector in AlexNet, in VGG, in GoogleNet, in ResNet. So you can see the IOU of the house detectors keep increase when you're re using deeper network. So the house detector in GoogleNet, uh, ResNet can de detect more compact house. So here's the airplane detector in, in AlexNet, in VGG, in GoogleNet, and in ResNet. So you can see the Airplane detectors in ResNet even can handle some change of skills or even some occlusion case. There are persons in standing of the airplane still can detect. So it's a very reliable airplane detector. So if we, if we annotate the internal units, then we can do the object detection and the same classification in a single pass. So from this result, I can answer the second question. So how to interpret the internal representations. So we have this network dissection to quantify the interpretability of units. So we measure the interpretability at the degree of alignment between unit activations and uh, our predefined um, dictionaries of concept. So I get into the third question, so why the network gives such prediction? So previously I already showed you that there are a lot of interpretable units emerge inside the network. How it's relevant to the final prediction? So I propose a technique called the class activation mapping to explain the prediction of deep neural network. So let's say for this two giving photos, so I was giving a talk at uh, CVPR last year at Hawaii, and for this image, give me the conference center and give me a poster presentation, give me prediction, uh, places coming out, give me the prediction in doubles. So why this network give me the predictions? So this technique can generate a heat map to highlight which region is the most uh, informative regions. So for the first image is highlights the microphone region in the most uh, inf informative regions. So for the second one is highlight the poster boards in the most informative regions. So how this technique work? It's actually very simple and uh, straightforward. So here's a very standard network. So giving an input image, that's several convolutions. Then there's a global average pool in there. And it will global pull each feature map into a single value. Then there, there is a logistic regression after this. So it's a very standard classification network. So right now we have the class probability then we want to build a connection between the class probability and the 
internal representation. Let's say we want uh, connecting the class probability and the last convolution layers activation. The FKHW is a feature map for unit K. So there is a layer between the two, so called global average pooling. So it will global pool the feature map into a single value. So because of these layers, we can write this into an equation. So here is a global average pooling, then there's a logistic regression WK at this. Then you give me the probability. So the class probability is, is uh, proportional to, to this value. Because of the uh, re linear relationship between the inner summation and the outer summations, we actually can switch the two and put the WK inside the inner summation. So it becomes WK multiply each feature map first, then we average them. So this inner summation actually have very, very interesting um, meanings. So it means we first uh, multiply the W1 in the logistic regressions with uh, unit one's activation, multiply the W2, multiply the second unit activation, then we get the weighted sum uh, feature map. So this feature map, I give a name called the class activation map. So this class activ activation map actually showed what is the most in in informative regions. So if we average this map, then actually we average this, then we get the probability. So you can consider this as spatial visualization of the, of the predicted uh, probability. So using this heat map, I can do, I can analyze uh, the prediction of the network. So let's say for this given image, give me the top three prediction at the dome, palace and the church. So for each one of the prediction, I can generate a heat map. Right? For the first one generates, uh, it highlights the, the dome regions. The second one, the palace, it highlights the bottom um, regions. And the third one predicted um, as a church and combine the two, the dome region and the church regions. So to give you the intuition why this network uh, gives such predictions. So we want to further evaluate how accurate the heat map can localize the object. So I apply this to weekly supervised localization task. So basically it's a scenario that we have a classification network and we apply the classification network for localization without training with bounding box. So we evaluate. So after we get the prediction for each one of the image, we generate the heat map. So from the heat map, we can generate the bounding box. So from the bounding box, we can localize the object inside the input image. So we evaluate on the ImageNet localization benchmark so it turns out our method outperformed the previous weekly supervised method with large margin, even getting closer to the fully supervised method. Because the fully supervised method trained with the bounding box. So our method is more like we get the localization ability out of a classification network for free without training with any bounding box annotation. So we want to further use this to analyze the failure case, because it's always interesting to the failure case. So here is a photo I took uh, last year when we visited David Bao's house. It's such a fancy house. We spent Thanksgiving there. <laughs> so, so this is a living room of David Bao's house. So I input the image to my places common at. It should give me the prediction, like ideally as a David Bao's house. But give me the prediction as a sushi bar. So I have no idea why this is a sushi bar. So I generate a heat map. It actually highlights Shuming and Joe Tong sitting there as a sushi chip, maybe sushi <laughs> chip, and uh, also maybe also the wooden chair activates the image. So here's another photos. So it's just a boring person, my friend, sits on the floor. It looks like a poor grad student whose paper gets rejected. <laughs> <laughs> so I throw this image inside our demo and generate. This gave me the prediction as a martial arts gym. So I have no idea why this martial arts gym. So uh, I run my method. It actually turns out the bare feet is the most informative regions for prediction at martial arts speed. Be because in a martial arts gym, you, you will not wear shoes. So it's no such bells to identify this image. So we further apply this to analyze the uh, failure case in videos. So we take a state-of-the-art model trained on image nets and then apply it to a video. So for each one of the Input frame, we generate top one prediction, then we generate heat map. So you can see sometimes it can highlight the, the informative regions. The screen window. So you can see the tension of the network keeps shifting. We detect the mountain bike. 
also make some mistake. Also for this one, give some lemon. When we zoom in, it predicted us finding a speedboat. So there are a lot of mistakes and uh, some successful case. So let's take a look at the uh, three cases. So the, the failure case. So the first, first one is a uh, predicted park bench. Second one is present. Third one is a uh, aircraft carrier. So it generates a heat map. So for the first one, the network actually mistake the staircase as a park bench. So for the second one, the present, it actually highlights a building at the background because there's so many windows at the, in the building. It's a mistake that it also detects the relays as a uh, present patterns. So the third one, we generate heat maps, uh, actually mistakes the speedboats as an aircraft carrier because the speedboat is very far away. It can, cannot cle clearly see the speedboat. So, so here we recap. So I really show you that there are a lot of interpretable units emerge inside the network when we train the network for some visual, re uh, visual recognition task. Then we further use the internal representations to build explanation for the final prediction. So here right now we just train the network on those normal nature image. So we also try this on some medical image. Let's say we train on those medical image. So we train this network for, for predicting the breast cancer. So we analyze the network and we show that a lot of internal units emerge as a disease um, tissue detector. Like these are two units that are detecting those Marsis or Vascaso calcification. So we can further use this to build build explanation for the prediction. Why this given this uh, input medical image as breast cancer then because there are some calcified vessels. So it'd be very useful to those medical applications to build explanation for the AI, medical AI system. So here is a summary of the contribution for Machis' work. So there are two lines of work. The first line of work is interpreting the deep models. So we propose different methods to interpret the internal units or analyze the decision making of the systems. Also have a second level of work to create uh, diverse visual benchmarks such as places for scene recognition and the ADE20K for scene parsing. So here are some con contributions. So we release uh, all the data and pre models to the community. It's amazing to see that people are using the data and the demos for or the models for their applications. So we host the places challenge at ICCV, ECCVs, and more than, more than 60 is worldwide participating in our challenge. Also the places database have been widely used in the communities to already generate uh, 1,200 citations for this NIPS papers. So we also release the models, get a lot of stars on the GitHub. So people use these models in their applications. Also for this MIT ADE 20K scene parsing libraries, we released this uh, several weeks ago. So we get uh, almost close to 1,000 stars. So people use the models to their scenarios for scene parsing and, uh, or scene understanding task. Also there's some follow up work on network interpretations. For example, the Andrew Ying using our models to interpret the network trained for uh, lung cancer diagnosis. So even uh, advertised at his, his own Facebook to show those heat map. The heat map generated by the class activation map. So also this technique has been used to localize the audios and uh, on the image. It has been used to forecast, forecasting where the hands will go, to generate heat map to understand and why the networks give such predictions. So you may wonder what's next. So we have some ongoing work. So we want to move towards um, video understanding to understand the events in, in videos. So we have uh, recently we have built a large scale data set, a video data set called Moments. These Moments have 1 million videos from 340 event categories. So here I show you some video samples from the categories. So category in this data set is pretty generic. We call it uh, atomic actions. So we have the like animal carrying, some people carrying the bike, also the crawling of the leader crawling and the baby crawling. It's supposed to, so we want the understanding the generalization of the activities. So we, so we also propose some network architectures um, that's interpretable, also efficient for event recognition. So build this temporal relation network to recognize activities. Like for example, for, uh, for this event, like the person poke a step or can the fall down. So the models don't have to go through whole, the whole videos. So we can use a keyframe 
to recognize activities. Through that, we build a network called uh, Temporal Relation Network to learn the dependencies across different frames. Then we can get a better accuracy only using um, maybe 20% of the frames. So it's both interpretable and efficient. So also in future, I want to get into um, those learning jointly in real and uh, simulated environments. For example, previous work, so we annotate, we spend so much time to annotate the images and annotate the videos, but we have such simulations, so we can just run those 3D simulation environments, then we can get all the data. Then we want, so in future work, I would like link the real learning and simulation learnings together. So finally we come to the end. So, I read, so for this thesis work, I've done many, many work in visual scene understanding and the scene parsing activity recognition. So in future, I want to apply this interpretable representation learning to real scenario, such as autonomous driving, healthy care application, and the whole robot. Okay, so we come to the acknowledgement. So I guess you guys will think I will show you a, a slide full of face. So of course not. So I would like to share, share you a story about myself. So as a, as a PhD student, we always need to read more papers. So I would like to share you three papers that changed my life. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the three papers? So the first paper is actually this paper. So this paper is a uh, co-author by Aldo Oliva and uh, Antonio Tarova, which are my, in my thesis committee. So I actually went through this paper about 10 years ago. So 10 years ago, I, I'm playing a band. I have no idea about what's its computer vision. So I'm just doing very messy work. So one of the man, band members sent this paper to me, so who he is called Xiaodi. So Xiaodi actually went to Caltech for, <laughs> as a computer, uh, computational neuroscientist. So he sent me the paper, said, you should read this paper. This is a very outstanding paper. So I read the papers. I'm so impressed by the ideas inside the papers, such as you applying the signal processing ideas, also integrates the uh, attributes, learning insights, um, the, the scene recognition. So I really like the paper. Then this is one of the first few computer vision papers I read. So after I read these papers, I decide to do in computer vision research. So at that time, I didn't realize I will come to MIT as a PhD student and working with Aud and Antonio. So it's an amazing paper. Uh, you should read it. <laughs> so how about the uh, second paper? So which one could be, could be maybe 80 tiny images or could be anti pinhole hole camera? So actually my own papers. <laughs> 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 this paper is actually my first publications. My publication at the ACCV 2009. This is my first paper is on scene recognition. So the name, you see the sync is GIST, so it's a tribute to the first papers. Also the fancy word, generative models. I guess I should continue working on this at that time. Maybe I would invent the adversary training, generative adversary <laughs> training. So this paper is about scene recognition. So I'm working on the, the 18 sync categories, so build a very stupid models and get some numbers on this benchmark and publish it. But this really mean a lot to me because it's the first paper I published. So I start interested in computer vision research and try to dis finally decide doing serious vision research. How about the third papers? So the third paper is also my own paper. <laughs> <laughs> so is this NIPS papers? So this NIPS paper is a uh, what I think the first project I work with Antonius and Ott. So from this paper, I spent so much time collecting data. So I received so many angry emails from the workers because we paid them too low. <laughs> <laughs> so we collect 10 million images, but finally we collect 10 million images and uh, we release a paper to the, or release a paper and the data set and portray model to the communities. So from doing this work, so I know how to, how to present research work and how, so, how to socialize with other researchers. So we, I also built the scene recognition demos. So this demo actually making me realize it's important to build some system that really work. And we, we, then we can test this, this, this models around. So we also release the data to the community and uh, we host this places challenge. So this places challenge make me realize this is uh, such a large 
vision community. So we need to open source our models and the data and this community can do far more interesting things by ourselves. So actually all those just one paper that changed my life is this paper and two person changed my life, Antonio and Ott. So I really, thanks. <laughs> um, so you can see because it's one paper, so I, <laughs> so I, I mean, I supposed to become a rock star maybe, <laughs> but I switched to a uh, computer vision researcher, so sadly. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what's next? But right now I, I didn't get a job yet, but uh, I think I will figure it out what, what will become next. I guess I will, I, will, I will read more papers and be given another paper that changed my life. <laughs> Finally, I would like to thank my mentors, like another committee member not here, Frido, <laughs> and also the collaborators and, uh, and friends that really changed my life here, make my life at, at the CISO and MIT much easier. So that's the end of my 